Lee code is hard, not just because the problems are hard, but because it's confusing to know where to even start. Now, when I started, I couldn't even solve easy problems properly for interviews, but really I had no choice. So I kept going, made a ton of mistakes, spent countless hours trying to figure it out. And then a few years later, I got hired by Microsoft and got offers from companies like Google, Shopify, and various other startups. Now I've helped dozens land six figure jobs at their dream tech companies. And most people think that they're bad at Lee code, but that's not true. They're just early in the process. Lee code is a completely different beast from normal coding. And in the beginning, it's really a different way that you need to think about these problems than you would if you were just jumping into coding out project. So at the beginning of your journey here, you shouldn't focus on solving lead code problems. You really need to focus on learning the solutions and the patterns. Early on, the goal is really how you build your intuition, not just to prove how smart you are. Most problems that you see, especially for the first time, you're not going to know how to solve them. You can spend hours trying to come up with a super clever solution, or you can try to build that pattern recognition by learning that individual pattern, then trying it again later on. So for example, if I wanna learn something like binary trees, right? I'd make two lists. So I'd have some easy questions and some medium questions, and then I would split these lists in half. Now for the first half of the problems, I'm not gonna try to solve them. I'm just gonna learn the common solutions and recognize the patterns. I'm gonna do that by going through the problem, trying to take a guess at what the solution may be, and then if I can't figure it out really quickly, I'm gonna look into the problem, look into the solution, see what they did, try to understand that, and then remember that for later. I'm gonna do that for about half of the problems until I understand the common patterns that pop up. Now for the second half of the problems, this is where you actually start solving. Right? And if you get stuck and you're spending say 45 minutes and you can't even get a basic solution, it's usually a new pattern that you haven't seen before. So learn the pattern, move on, and don't waste hours just brute forcing a solution. It's not smart to sit there and struggle for four or five hours on a single problem. If you can't get it relatively quickly, look at the solution, try to focus on memorizing and kind of picking up that pattern recognition, and then you'll be good from there. Now this method here, right, where you're not just solving right away, builds that pattern recognition way faster. Now in terms of the type of problems to do here, you wanna be focusing on the core patterns, doing one pattern at a time. So starting with things like arrays, then two pointers, then hashing, and there's a whole long list and you can go to sites like NeatCode, for example, where all of the problems are organized for you. But just remember that you're focusing on that pattern recognition and the intuition, not trying to prove how smart you are, just brute forcing every single problem. If you're able to do about a hundred problems, that's usually a good amount of volume to start building that intuition. And that's what you need to aim for to get those a hundred problems done as soon as possible while still retaining all of the information and all of those patterns patterns that you're picking up along the way. Now, once you've done a good amount of problems and you're starting to build that pattern recognition, it's time to talk about the reality of interviewing, right? So solving a problem in an interview feels nothing like solving one alone, right? It's like you're performing on stage, you've got the cameras on you, and it's a completely different experience. You have to talk, think, and solve at the same time, and that's why the intuition matters from that previous step. When you get asked a question, you pretty much either just recognize the pattern right away and know what you need to do, or you don't, right? Now, if you don't, what you really need to do is talk out loud as much as possible because the interviewer will typically try to give you some hints or guide you in the right direction if they can see that you don't know it right away. Overall, they want to see how you think. So with that being the reality, it's extremely important that you practice these problems properly. Now, once you've practiced on your own and you're able to solve most of the medium problems without a massive amount of difficulty, that's enough to start diving into mock interviews and really simulating the interview environment, right? You need to practice like you're going to play, which means that you need to actually practice speaking out loud practice communicating with someone, asking those clarifying questions. One thing that I did when I was practicing is I bought a whiteboard, I put it in my room, and for all of the questions that was kind of near the end of my practice, I would do them like I was in a real interview. I would write them out on the whiteboard, I would practice in front of my friends, I would pay coaches to practice with me, and that really helped a significant amount. So again, once you get through most of those medium problems and you're feeling more comfortable, you can start practicing on sites like Pranked. Now that's great, you can practice for free there or you can pay a really small amount, but this is also something that we provide inside of our dev launch program with students like Eric, who just landed in a $100,000 per year job. Now, if you're interested in that, you can click the link below and you can watch our free training. We do all kinds of mock interviews with our students so that we can get them in the habit of communicating properly, give them real objective feedback and show them exactly what it's going to be like when they're in a real interview environment. That's because you really need to get used to the pressure that you're going to have and the communication. 
most people can sit there and grind leak code and you know understand how to answer these types of problems but a lot of people really struggle on that communication part which is why you need to practice smarter not harder right simulate the real interview environment actually practice communicating because that's the part that you're probably going to fail at. It's usually not purely the technical side of things. Now, with that in mind, you also don't just want to grind thousands of leak code problems, right? Make sure you have a solid roadmap. You stick to the questions that you've defined are going to make up kind of the core important patterns and don't spend a massive amount of time working on, you know, extremely difficult problems that aren't likely to show up in an interview. Again, inside of DevLaunch, we have a really detailed roadmap we provide students. If you wanna just find one for yourself, you can go online, look up leak code or TSA roadmaps, and just find a solid resource that has you know, 100 to 150 problems that you can follow along with. Now, with that in mind, when you look at a lot of these question lists, you're gonna notice that they're organized by categories. And that's because you really wanna think about leak code like a pyramid. So for example, the base of the pyramid is gonna be all of your common patterns. These are arrays, hash maps, and two pointers, okay? Those are always gonna come up. They make up most of the easy and medium problems. And if you can answer those, you're gonna be able to solve most interview questions. Then the top of the pyramid is more advanced topics like dynamic programming, graph problems, uh, for example, backtracking, right? These are the ones that aren't gonna pop up as commonly, but may appear in some more senior level interviews. Now this means that you wanna focus most of your time on the base of the pyramid because these are the patterns that repeat everywhere. Now in 10 plus interviews, I've never been asked a dynamic programming problem, but I always get arrays, trees, two pointers, hash maps, that just always comes up. And even in more complicated problems, it usually just uses a combination of some of the easier or base level patterns. So again, you wanna make sure that you focus most of your time on those patterns and then only go to the advanced ones once those are extremely solid. It's just that classic 80-20 rule applies pretty much everywhere and especially here. So now let me dive into some tips on what actually matters here when you're in the interview. So a lot of people think when they get asked these DSA type problems that they're always expected to come up with the most complex solution possible. That is definitely not the case. You don't always want to be chasing, you know, the most optimized solutions. You want to make sure that you go for one that's actually reasonable for you to solve in the time that you're given. A lot of times the interviews are actually looking to see how you discuss the different trade-offs, how you kind of walk through your thought process and explain, okay, these are the three different solutions I could potentially go with. And this is the one I'm going to choose for X, Y, Z reason. There's a lot of problems you get asked where it's not feasible to implement the optimal solution in the amount of time given. That's actually a trick question that they're looking for and what they want to see is that if you can determine that trade-off and still come up with something that makes sense that you're able to actually implement. So major tip there at the beginning of your interview, always discuss the potential avenues or solutions you could go with especially if you're aware of multiple different approaches, then pick one that's not the worst solution, but probably not the best or most complicated and go ahead and solve that, assuming you know you're gonna be able to do it in the amount of time. Obviously there's situations where you can go for the most optimal solution, especially if you know how to implement it. But if you're not quite sure or it's something that you're a little bit confused on or it's not gonna be clear to explain, just go for one in the middle, get it down, solve it, explain it, and that's gonna yield you more results because you'll actually have an answer. Now I wanna quickly dive into the higher manager rounds. So typically when you go through these interview loops, the last interview that you have is going to be with the hiring manager, the person who will ultimately make the final decision. It's not always the case, but usually that's going to be a mix of a technical question as well as some kind of business chat or kind of a behavioral interview. Now, it's extremely important that for this type of interview that you do your homework, right? Understand the company's product, their tech stack, any news that they have recently, their values, their mission statement. That's something that they're going to be looking for and bring that up naturally in the conversation when you're asking the hiring manager questions. Overall, an interview is not meant to be this kind of one-way battle. It's really a two-way street where you should also be interviewing the company and determining, do you really want to work there, right? In any interview that I've gone into where I've been successful, it's felt more like a conversation where we're genuinely seeing if we're a good fit as opposed to this kind of battle or test that you're being given. So it's extremely important if you were interviewing at Meta, for example, you know what they're working on recently. You know why they changed their name to Meta from Facebook, for example. You know what their vision is, what their mission is, and you know what their values are so you can naturally weave that into the conversation and show that you came prepared. A lot of developers really fail this behavioral part of the interview, and this is a massive challenge 
chance to stand out. And even if you don't completely ace the technical side of things, you'll just give yourself a significantly better chance. Overall, if you can communicate clearly and effectively, you're already in the top 1% of developers because most just really suck at it. And that's why I spend a massive amount of time kind of drilling this point home, especially with my students, so that they really know how to communicate effectively and they're not nervous because it just makes them stand out a ton. Now, just one final message here. Getting good at this takes time. It's not something you're gonna do in a few weeks. For me personally, it took over a year of doing a ton of practice before I was confident to walk into interviews and ace them. That said, if you have the right plan and you have the right strategy, you absolutely can do this. And once you build that pattern recognition and that intuition, while you can be rusty sometimes, you can just pick it up super fast and get back into the interview cycle and be ready to get a new job, right? Now, if this is something that you found interesting and you want help with this from ex Google, ex Amazon, and ex Microsoft software engineers, then click Click the link below, I've left a video that explains exactly how we help you get in shape for interviews and practice everything so that you can land that next job.